This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. No animals were harmed in the production of this episode. What happened with the second one was there were these kids playing in the backyard. August 1953, Springfield, Missouri. So maybe they're playing catch for attending their stand usual. Or better yet, there's a sprinkler sweeping lazy arcs, the sun making rainbows in the spray as the kids jump through getting soaked and laughing. And their dog, some bulldog mix, is rooting something out of the shrubs by the fence that separates their house from Mr. Moore's. And then the dog's going crazy, and he's got hold of something. He's thrashing his head. Then a black snake flies through the air and lands in the grass. And the kids start screaming. And their father busts through the screen door and bounds down the back steps. These are the foothills of the Ozarks, and snakes here can kill you. But dad's lived here his whole life and knows what to do with the snake. So he grabs a hoe, he swings it up, he swings it down, and that's that. Kids head back into the house, dog calms down, and the dad goes to clean up the bloody mess and has a start. Never seen a snake like that before. Calls his neighbor over, a guy across the street, who looks at the body and says, Huh, I killed one of those with a hoe last week, too. So that's what happened with the first one. The next thing you know, the cops are there. They put the severed snake in a big jar and bring it to a professor at the local college who peers at the creature through his horn-rimmed glasses. And it is just about the damnedest thing he ever did see. And he tells the cops, there are Indian cobras in Springfield, Missouri. Everyone in town starts talking. Turns out there had been a third one, same neighborhood. Woman was weeding her garden when a deadly viper native to a land 9,000 miles away crawled out of the bushes. She screamed, her husband ran, and another hoe came down on another cobra. In a fourth, just a few days later, some teenagers out driving, headlights caught something slithering across the road, they ran it over, finished it off with a tire iron. There was a scarlet macaw on the front porch of the little house in the tree-lined street. It would say hello, delighting the kids who came to the pet shop Rio Moore ran out of his front parlor. And so it greeted the cops when they came looking for Moore. They had reason to suspect the pet shop owner was responsible for the deadly cobras crawling around town. For instance, all of them had been found within a block or two of his home. And he had been known to keep exotic animals, like the boa constrictors that sometimes shared the front porch with the talking bird, or the alligators tied up in his garage, or the penguin that used to squawk when he hosed it down in the backyard. Suspicious, too, was the fact that his animals often broke out leaving his neighbors to complain about six-foot iguanas on the roofs or monkeys in their oak trees. Also, Moore had several wooden crates filled with live cobras in his basement. That seemed like a clue. But when the cops suggested that he, a man who had dozens of deadly vipers in his house, a man who was known primarily to his neighbors as the weird guy with all the exotic animals which kept escaping into their yard, was somehow responsible for all the deadly vipers that had escaped into people's yards, Rio Moore said nope. Not my deadly vipers. The cops were incredulous, but Moore was firm. Sure he had cobras, but none of his cobras were missing. Must be someone else's cobras. And this was preposterous on its face. Rio Moore was the only importer of Indian cobras in the United States. But Moore knew two true things. First, according to state and local statutes, he hadn't done anything illegal. And second, in the absence of laws, and in the absence of shame, you can just lie and lie and lie. Meanwhile, a fifth cobra was killed when a little girl was sent to fetch something for her mom in the garage and found herself face to face with the cobra, hood out, hissing, and she screamed and her mom rushed in and took it out with one of Springfield's apparently ubiquitous hoes. Police Chief Frank Pike's phone was ringing off the hook, citizens calling constantly, freaking out that there were freaking cobras crawling around other people calling for Rio Mora's head. The chief got one call from Mora's neighbor, saying he saw a cobra crawl into a crevice in the concrete steps of his house. Then Mora ran over, grabbed the snake by the head, and ran off with it, saying, nothing to see here, just a regular snake, no cobra's hair, you thought you saw a hood, but it wasn't a hood, totally not a cobra, while hiding it in his arms. That was probably the sixth cobra. But the sixth confirmed dead cobra. Chief Pike saw to that one himself. Some men found it under a house around the corner from the pet shop. The cops showed up, then they smoked it out with tear gas. Pike's men shot the thing six times, somehow don't manage to kill it. 
then leaving the chief himself to snare the snake with some makeshift snake snaring pole and lasso contraption, and then finish the job himself with the by then time-honored Missouri tradition of whacking a cobra with a hoe. And then the phone calls were coming from all over. The national newspapers, international herpetologists, to which he surely said, herpa what? And they said, snake experts. And he said, why didn't you just say that? And then he's getting anti-venom shipped in from a zoo in Florida. And a mail-order copy of Dittmar's Snakes for the World, which he reads cover to cover and keeps in his pocket. He stations his men on the porch of Moore's shop, round the clock. The macaw must have driven them crazy. They were there less to keep an eye out for snakes, because at this point Moore had bent to pressure and shipped all his remaining cobras to a roadside snake show in Kentucky, then to keep scared Springfieldians from burning the place down. Moore wasn't helping his case at all. When reporters showed up to cover the cobras, the eighth one died just down the road. More teenagers, another car, another squished snake. Moore would repeat his firm statement that no cobras ever went missing from his shop. He proposed that maybe a circus train stopped in Springfield and some slithered out and just happened to wind up in his neighborhood. It's an incredible coincidence. And then he'd go on and on about how cobras weren't all that dangerous. They, they only injected their venom once they'd completely clamped onto you. So it wasn't just a quick bite and you're dead sort of thing. So the key was just don't let them completely clamp onto you. And besides, there were deadly snakes all over the Ozarks. There were rattlesnakes and cottonmouths and copperheads and coral snakes. A cobra was hardly any more dangerous than any of those. People were just afraid because of movies and dime store adventure novels. And no one in town wanted to hear that. They were forming a snake posse. Taking to the streets with shotguns and hatchets and hoes, of course there were hoes, and baseball bats, that most American of weapons. And they were afraid. These were cobras. The town's director of health and safety got a recording some Missourian missionary made on a trip to India. Authentic snake charming music straight from the streets of Calcutta. They rigged up a flatbed truck with a PA and speakers and drove around the streets of Springfield hoping to draw out the cobras. Rio Moore told another reporter that this was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. Snake charming was a total scam. Cobras didn't even have ears. He went on and on about their anatomies and their habits and their diets. He, he claimed to know a ton about cobras, just absolutely nothing about where these particular ones came from. And so on it went. The time that Springfield, Missouri was beset by Indian cobras. The police chief, half crazed by the whole thing, half kind of loving it. The attention, the break from small town crime in a mid-sized town and the spooked kids who couldn't sleep, and the parents who broke down and let them crawl into bed, and the good old boys rolling out of some bar at closing time and keeping things rolling with a carry-up bottle and an impromptu cobra hunt, prowling the back streets and drunk and laughing in the last warm night air of late September, and all the bad pranks played, all the conversations started at the bank and the feed store and the VFW hall. And the snakes. The ninth cobra was smashed with the boulder. The tenth was cut in two, which was another strong advertisement for off-label hoe usage. The eleventh was found in a plumbing supply shop, where there were plenty of pipes on hand with which to whack it. The twelfth was caught alive and taken to a local zoo. And that was the last cobra they found in Springfield, Missouri in those strange months of 1953. Some folks figured that the snakes froze to death when winter came. The winters are mild there in that corner of the state, but still, a lot colder than Calcutta. For his part, Chief Pike figured they were probably done with the whole thing before winter even came anyway. There were 10 or 12 to a box in Rio Moore's basement, though folks still worried that they'd come back. Maybe they were off breeding, maybe they would terrorize them even worse when summer came. For years, people would tell teenagers who liked to sneak out to the old quarry to swim, to watch out. The cobras probably took to the caves for shelter and would go after the first warm body they found, a pointed warning to the young couples who went there to fool around. As for Rio Moore, he moved on. Tough to sell pets when you are the town pariah. Went down to Florida, popped up again in the papers in the mid-60s when he tried to mail a Galapagos turtle to his father back home in Missouri. Rio Moore Jr. had been living near St. Pete, renting out exotic animals for commercials and birthday parties and whatnot. It was a good business for a while, but then Bush Gardens Wild Animal Park opened up in Tampa and just couldn't compete. 
He died in 1970, and he never ever copped to the fact that the Cobras were his, though they totally were. But here is the thing. He didn't let the snakes out. 35 years after those strange days and sleepless nights of 1953, a man named Carl Barnett told his story to a columnist in the Springfield News Leader. Barnett had been 14 that summer and loved hanging out at the pet shop, loved saying hello to the macaw, loved how you never knew what kind of creature you were going to get to see there. And he saved up his lawn mowing money to buy a tropical fish, brought it home in a little jar filled with water. And when he transferred it to the fishbowl at home, it died. And when he went back the next day looking for his money back and instead got some sort of know-it-all lecture from Rio Moore, he was mad. And when he found some boxes of snakes stacked up in the back and opened one up as revenge, he had no idea they were cobras. And so the next weeks were just fear that someone would get bit, that he might get bit, that he might deserve to get bit. In months, in years it turned out, that he would get caught, which is a terrible way to live with this secret just out there, like some deadly viper slithered free from your neighbor's in-home pet store. <laughs> 